Welcome to Great Power Politics. In today's class, we will focus on the future of power of the United States in the 21st century. And so we will focus primarily on the ideas, um, how does um, uh, the US power evolve? Will it continue staying the same? Will it decline? What kind of problems are existent in the, uh, in the country? And how do we see the future? So we do have several scholars um, which are thinking about um, a decline of, uh, of the hegemonic power of the United States. And within the popular press, we do see a, a strong focus on the competition with, um, between China and the United States. This has been prominent in a trade war, but also um, in other aspects. And um, I want to highlight in this class also the work of Joseph Nye, who says that um, extended competition um, or the ideas about, about uh, being in constant competition might lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy that conflict actually occurs because the expectation of the different parties is that this conflict occurs. So um, I hope this will be an interesting lecture and I will go right into the slides. Thank you. So, kind of look at the future of American power, we first have to look at the history. And if you look at the history, we can see uh, that the United States is very, uh, has become after the end of the Second World War, very powerful, more powerful maybe than any actor before it. And we have talked about this in, in respect of Eikenberry's uh, work about, um, about uh, liberal um, hegemon, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So several kind of reasons why we can we can find that. But at the point, it is undisputed that they are very powerful. And so um, let's see a little bit more from a theoretical perspective why this could be the case. Now, if I look, uh, if we kind of look at it conceptually, we could of course kind of think about it. So if there is one single power, and it's not the United States. Who would it be? Who would be the main opponent to the United States? But lots of people say this is quite unrealistic and we would rather think about multiple powers than one single power. So if you take about multiple powers, who could they be? Would it be China? Um, would it be India? Would it be um, Japan? The European Union? Who would be these kind of key multiple actors? And of course, this seems a bit, um, uh, the, the question seems a bit misguided because until now, even though the United States is the, is the hegemon, we also do see alliances and the, generally the West, as we, we often call it, has many actors involved and among others, Europe and, and Japan. And so it is not necessarily true that everything is um, that everything is kind of lonely uh, taken by the United States. But an interesting part which we see at the moment is that the United States is becoming less um, multilateral. And, we, and what I, do I mean by multilateral? Well, less cooperative with other actors. We could think about this in from, from several perspectives. One, maybe the United States is not depending so much on its the collaboration anymore and therefore wants to do multilateral action. The other could be that actually it is not as powerful in this uh, coalition of the multilateral actors anymore and therefore wants to go alone because it feels that the, that the, the partners have a too big a say. Or it is just a policy decision by specific actors who are not in favor of multilateralism because it is complicated and other, and other issues. And therefore a conscious choice um, to, for the United States to act more unitarily, but also maybe a choice which leads uh, towards a decrease of the power of the United States. The last point I want to raise here is this kind of new forms of global governance. Um, maybe we are kind of not leading necessarily in the power structure from one party 
um, to another party in terms of that that um, that in a, in a uh, in a realist perspective, one state is overtaking another state. But rather, we are looking at the situation where other actors become more important. Maybe inter, uh, uh, international organizations or, um, or, or uh, um, uh, cross-national actors, non-governmental organizations, etc., will become more powerful in the future. And we don't necessarily see the same kind of international structure where states are at the center of it. A lot of people would say this is quite far-fetched and why would we talk about this now? Um, the process is nothing, nothing kind of substantial changed in this way in, in, recent, in recent years. Um, but if we look in a longer term in history, it is not uh, clear that, um, um, that, it, that always states had to be at the center. This is something which is maybe like a last century, a little maybe one and a half centuries. Uh, has been the focal point because this was the way we structured our states. Uh, but it's not necessarily that true forever. And we could, of course, new modes of governance could also be introduced. Probably not very quickly, but slowly they could take over the, the general state level um, uh, focus. I want to, to pause the video here now quickly and write down um, your answer to whether the United States uh, will rule the 21st century. You can upload this on Padlet. Um, of course, I would wish um, that you take a little bit longer uh, or a bit, write a bit more elaborative than just say yes or no. Maybe give a little bit about your reason. Write it down. I would be really curious um, to see uh, what your um, what you have been thinking about this situation. This important part is that you do this actually now and not necessarily listen to the whole lecture first, but rather kind of write it down now and then kind of also at the end you can also see did you change your opinion? Does this have any impact on it or is it basically the same as of the start of the class? Okay, so make pause it now and uh, we see you in a couple of minutes again. So welcome back. Um, in a way, I want you to um, to take one step back at this point and say, like, how do we know anything about the future? Can we kind of? It's it as we um, as uh, as a lot of people who are in my in my uh, seminar classes I know I I'm always allergic against them having research designs which kind of include. Uh, situations in the future. Why is this the case? Well, because we can't really test empirically, we can't test anything which involves a future event because we don't know how they will turn out. Um, but in this class, of course, it's very much about a uh, gear towards looking what will happen in the future and what uh, if we can see kind of um, structural changes, etc. Um, so in a way, I want to kind of focus a little bit on um, on this in terms of being how we could inform our our predictions about the future from the past. And I, I take here um, the idea about historical patterns. So in a way, Ian Morris and, uh, wrote um, in 2011, uh, actually a quite, quite interesting work, I think, where he said like, history is not just that um, one thing after another. Uh, it is rather something which has a kind of a, a, a path. Um, there are certain patterns involved in history, and these kind of patterns, if we understand them, we can make more better educated guesses about what will happen in the future. So we do see that, um, and if we kind of look at this uh, from a global power perspective, we do see that there is a rise and a, uh, and a decline of global powers and that that seemed to go a continuum. Of course, this is kind of opponent to the idea of, um, of Eikenberry, where he said like, well, this time it might not be the case because we, are, um, we have this inter, um, international institutions which serve a prolonging situation of, um, uh, of uh, keeping the, the current hegemon in power. But um, it seems that these kind of patterns are continuing to be true. 
And maybe at a certain point, we will find a decline of the US power in these circumstances. Um, another thing, this is not a, it's just a short um, uh, side note, but uh, I think it's quite, uh, um, quite interesting is the, 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 um, this comment of Mark Twain, uh, not an, of course, not an academic uh, idea, but still very kind of uh, interesting. And he says, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. What does he mean by that? Well, actually, he thinks that we do f something similar to, um, to the previous slides, that we do find patterns in behavior. And these kind of patterns are um, not completely random, but actually kind of follow a certain, a certain stream. And so it's important to understand this stream and to know what, what will happen in the future to a certain power. Um, I also want to kind of, one of the, the key scholars who is actually working within this field is Neil Ferguson. Um, and his historical analysis of great power failure is a very interesting one. Um, so if you have a chance, um, uh, look at this article in foreign um, complex uh, complexity and collapse in foreign affairs in um, 2010. Um, he basically kind of talks about something he calls a punctuated equilibrium. And he's, I will read this out and then we can kind of discuss quickly what, what it actually means. So great power and empires are complex systems made up of a very, a very large number of interacting components that are asymmetrically organized. Such systems can appear to operate quite stable for some time. They seem to be in equilibrium, but are in fact constantly adapting. But a very small trigger can set off a phase transition from a benign equilibrium to a crisis where the scale of disruption is nearly impossible to uh, anticipate. So I think this idea is very important and very interesting. It says like, we do have these kind of great powers and they have this uh, enormous uh, form of power and it seems like impossible to kind of change it. And, but it's not necessarily that we can see this as a unitary, as like a one kind of complex, everything um, uh, is, is kind of uh, connected to each other, but rather think like, it's a system where lots of different kind of parts um, are working into each other. And so if it happens that some parts or some vital parts are coming out of equilibrium, what do we mean by out of equilibrium? That they are not kind of um, working together so neatly in, uh, anymore. That can kind of create some problems for the, for the international system. And I'm sorry, for the, for, the, for the political system, not international, for the political system of this power. And so at the end of the day, what, uh, what Neil Ferguson uh, means with this is that we, we wouldn't expect to have like a slow decline where a power becomes less stable, less stable, less stable, less stable. And then eventually after a, a gradual kind of decline uh, would uh, disappear or, or, or collapse. But what we rather see is that a system works, um, seems to be powerful, works quite well. And we have these certain triggers, which then lead uh, to unravel a system. And that unraveling might not necessarily be seen beforehand as, as strongly as, um, um, or it can uh, not be anticipated beforehand as, as well um, um, at all. So Neil Ferguson is a historian. So he was looking at this in, in a historic context and he has like um, looked at uh, several emper uh, empires, the, the British Empire, also the Roman Empire, um, et cetera. So, and the Soviet Union. So he has looked at them in, in several parts there. But I think this idea is really kind of interesting because it says like we can't kind of find slowly declining indicators necessarily, but rather we have to look at this um, from a situation where where decline can happen in a rapid scale and is not necessarily anticipated beforehand in the same way. Okay, so I, I mentioned this already and we don't need to go through, um, through it, but to give you an idea about what we mean with an empire we, and, and the decline, we can think about 
about, of course, Rome is a kind of a typical, typical um, example for for the, one of the earliest empires. Uh, the Aztec, Maya, and Incas in South America can also be seen as empires within the reach, not the global reach, but the regional reach. The Ming Dynasty is a very big uh, um, Asian example of, a, of an empire. Uh, French monarchy, of course, in the 18th century in Europe. Uh, this, um, and so we can go on. I think maybe the most noticeable here, which we should kind of think about, is the British Empire. Why the British Empire? Because it had this first kind of a global uh, um, sp uh, span beforehand and then kind of uh, collapsed in this way. And the Soviet Union, because it's the one of the, of the more modern um, empires. So both like the British Empire fell after the Second World War. And why we can see lots of indications that the power actually reduced over time before that um, to fall in this way was not necessarily kind of anticipated. The Soviet Union again imploded in its way and it had lots of problems and the competition with the United States was really important. Uh, but Afghanistan and Chernobyl have seen which were kind of two events which um, the Afghanistan war was going on for some time but Chernobyl was of course not anticipated before but both kind of led to an acceleration of this system which is not necessarily predictable beforehand. Then, um, so a lot of people would say like, um, what about the United States? Is the Iraq war, the global financial crisis or the election of President Trump? Or maybe most recently the, the current pandemic, um, a factor which are kind of escalating the, the decline of the power? Or are these events just like certain crises which always happen uh, in the course of, um, of an empire? and don't necessarily need to lead to a power decline. They could even lead to a power increase, if you if you will. So if we kind of think about the collapse of a, of a, of a system, we can see a little bit of decline and um, the causes of decline and kind of categorize them in, in two bigger categories. The one is internally and the other is externally. Internally, of course, fiscal crisis like this is about finances. Um, overstretching of the system very often. That is something which we had in the uh, British Empire that it just became too big and was not uh, possible to actually govern it in an efficient way anymore. Or social and political fragmentation. So that actually there's a political split or a uh, social split, which kind of creates uh, cleavages which the political system cannot overcome anymore. So these are very internal um, uh, aspects of it. Um, which don't necessarily need an adversary or an opponent in it. The external factors are, of course, um, or, or, or often called like abuse of physical environment. Um, so that, what do we mean by this? Basically that maybe an actor becomes too, uh, too dominant in certain regions and therefore um, it kind of uses its dominance uh, uh, very aggressively and loses its kind of um, allies on the international stage because it becomes the, the actions become less accepted uh, generally. And the other thing, and that is the most common one we see is uh, or understand as a threat um, uh, to empires is this external threat, like maybe a, a change in the power, a power shift within the international system and maybe an actor becoming more powerful and therefore challenging the existing hegemony. Having said that, from all of these, uh, all of this kind of um, reasons can lead to a collapse um, of the international uh, of the of the hegemonic position of a power. We most likely think about this external threat as as a cause, but it's one of the least likely. So the other um, the other factors are e at least equally, if not more, important in the collapse of a political system. Okay, if we kind of go back to this idea about what are sources of power, um, we can, of course, as you know, uh, distinguish between hard powers and soft powers. In hard powers, uh, we primarily look at territorial population, economic power, finance, and military forces. We know that these are important. We also have talked about them extensively already. These kind of powers are a good measurement of, of a current situation in comparison to other actors. But again, if we think, talk about a hegemon, 
um, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense um, to say like, okay, it has double or triple the amount of weapons of its next opponent. Therefore, a country is safe, it's in a hegemonic position. Why? Because we have these other factors, the internal factors and also the abuse of physical environment, all of them are also contributing. And if we kind of think about hard power, we don't only think about this external threat, the lowest point here as a, as a key as a key factor, all the others we neglect. So in a way, hard power is not necessarily kind of uh, telling us the full, full picture. If you talk about soft power, um, maybe you can, in your mind, you can recall again what we mean by soft power. One of the important things is of course the, the, the knowledge. So how capable, um, uh, how many experts and, and hegemon has in order to advance it. It's, in, in social system, its political system, its um, its technology as well, yeah, and also how ap uh, appealing this culture is for external action. So we do have soft power. If it is the the way of thinking with one society, is generally accepted on a global scale. That's why often as, uh, the United States is seen as a as a very strong soft power as well, because with its kind of cultural background, its its uh, flourishing. Um, uh, literature, it's flourishing uh, movie uh, industry, etc. It on a global scale, people are familiar with the American culture and American way of thinking about things. Maybe much more than with other parts, uh, with other uh, regions of the world. I want to, you to look at. Um, I want to introduce you to this to this. Um, uh, um, uh, work of um, uh, about power of uh, Joseph Nye. Um, he's kind of focusing on uh, indicators of power resources, especially kind of looking at it in terms of the competition with the, um, with China and the role of soft power. And um, I have a linked a video here. I will not look at it, but please um, kind of go back to the slides. And um, um, I, I will post this, uh, this video also on the Padlet side. Take some time and have a look um, at these um, ideas about Joseph Nye. We will discuss them much more in our class um, as well. So please have a look at what he thinks. It's a very good video, I feel, uh, about the future of power. Um, okay, welcome back. I hope you watched the video and um, made your thoughts about it, had your thoughts about it. Um, if we kind of think about this last part about competition over power, we can kind of compare, of course, the, the factors, how the United States and China um, um, compete against other. But we have to say that this is a little bit limited. Why? Because, um, um, because it is, of course, not taking the full picture of how uh, uh, hegemons are ruling, as we kind of showed with Neil Ferguson and the different forms of power beforehand. So, in the terms of territory, of course, the United States and China are approximately of the same uh, form of territory. In a way, in a way, one let's say disadvantage China has in, in kind of uh, is that it is um, that a big part of its territory are actually um, affected by ethnic uh, conflict or strival if you if you wait so there is of course the uh, um, the the Uyghurs uh, in uh, Xinjiang province but also Tibet and the Tibetan uh, conflict uh, in Yunnan, there are some kind of, um, at the lower level, some kind of conflict as well. So we do it, of course, China is a multi-ethnic uh, country with a very big population, and it does have conflict, ethnic conflict as well, which it has to overcome. In a way, it is uh, keeping it um, relatively low at the moment is by using ex uh, strong force in order to kind of throw um, prevent any uprising or any demands by 
uh, ethnic minorities. So we have the re-education, so-called re-education uh, camps, which lots of people compare to concentration camps where people are re-educated in, in uh, Uyghur, the re um, kind of re called to be re-educated uh, and had to change their political as well as religious beliefs. Um, um, of course, this has been heavily criticized by the international community as, um, as a way of, of wiping out a, a culture. Um, but it shows very much how much force um, the, the, the Chinese government uses in order to prevent any kind of um, uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic struggle up, up, uh, um, flaring up. Uh, within its region. Of course, the, the Tibet conflict and it's, it's very well documented and you know, I guess you're all very well aware of it um, as, a, as a form of um, where the Tibetan uh, um, population and, and, and uh, its religious leadership has been suppressed by the Chinese government. In, in comparison, of course, the U.S. and China are not the biggest country. For example, if you kind of look at Russia, it's twice as big, um, but has uh, less than half of the population uh, of the United States. So population is also really important, of course. Um, China has a much bigger population and a much younger population than the United States. And that's often seen as one of its biggest advantages in this way, that it actually has these resources to uh, to build up its uh, this human resources to build up its economy even further, and because it is one third of the popul global population, a lot of people argue it should also, if it is well developed, it should also have one third of the global GDP because it can kind of uh, accumulate this trade. In terms of population, we could also look at India and say, like, okay, India might have. Uh, um, by 2030 might have the largest population in the world. It's a more fastly growing population, much faster than, of course, China, with the, which had for a very long time a one-child policy. And um, even though this is not uh, currently um, existent anymore, uh, lots of families are actually kind of sticking to, to having one child. Or, um, and so, so there's not much uh, population growth to be expected in the, in the near future, at least. Uh, India, on the other hand, has a large, uh, a very quickly uh, growing population. And of course, we will have a class where we talk about India in much more detail. But there are other issues, and that is the, the idea of, um, um, of the literature rate and, and kind of how productive people can be. And what we do see in India is that the, that the literacy rate of 61% is, of course, way below um, the ideas of what we do have in the um, um, in China. Okay, let's continue uh, with looking at uh, hard powers and uh, in political and uh, political, especially focusing on economic and financial power. Um, what can we kind of tell about this? If it um, well, we can kind of look at it and say like that the United States and China are approximately the same size in economy. Um, in a way, the U.S. continues to be the largest financial power in terms of markets and uh, market, uh, capital markets and the foreign direct investment. Also in terms of the, of the U.S. dollar as a lead currency. Having said that, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that this continues to be like this in the in the in the future, especially since in terms of digital currencies and other things, lots of new developments are taking place uh, within the uh, capital markets as well. Also, China's economy financial importance is really growing uh, quite quickly, and um, we shouldn't kind of well we see a huge dominance there. It's not necessarily given that this kind of continuing in the future. I will talk about this. A little more um, in, a, in a later slide. Uh, in terms of military forces, um, um, we also see that the United States is uh, clearly on the forefront. In terms of um, in terms of nuclear power, uh, the U.S. and Russia, for that respect, are still the the two dominant uh, nuclear superpowers. And while uh, Russia, we will talk about Russia in a, in a later class as well, but while Russia is not so important anymore in terms of economic 
um, power as well as, as um, uh, conventional cap uh, capabilities in terms of nuclear, um, um, the amount of nuclear warheads uh, Russia still has is, is enormous and therefore it's a really kind of important um, actor in this way. While um, China is a nuclear uh, power as well, has nuclear weapons as well, um, it seems that this is much um, not as, as um, highly um, uh, developed as, as the United States at the moment. One thing which we could say about uh, um, uh, about the U.S. maybe in comparison to China is that it it has the ability to project its power on a global stage and has done so in in several conflicts which have been quite far away from its mainland. While most other actors, are, I mean, if they project power, they projected it in very close range um, to their own territory. The United States has fought wars in Iraq and other places in the world. Um, which uh, which are of course much further away, and it is with uh, all its military bases, etc. It is capable of projecting power on a global stage, and maybe at this point, it's the only country which can really do that. So militarily, also the United States seems to be in superior to any kind of other country in the world. In terms of soft power, the U.S. also has some kind of really interesting um, aspects. Uh, so we, we often say that the US, Europe, and Japan are the continuing uh, uh, soft powers. Um, in, in terms of education, especially the United States, and to some extent, uh, the United Kingdom are really leading in, uh, in this fair. So the top universities are, of course, in the United States, and, uh, and the um, Anglo-Saxon uh, education is highly sought. Um, uh, so after a lot of people want to go to the U.S. to study, um, also Chinese people are kind of keen on on studying uh, in the United States. Even the the, um, the only child of Xi Jinping uh, has studied um, in a U.S. university. Um, so we do so we do see that there is a um, there is a considerable power from the universities. Also research development. Uh, patents and royalties, all of these kind of show the technological kind of advancement of, of the country and in all of these aspects, the United States is really important. So lots of um, top um, students from around the world are actually going uh, to, um, to the United Kingdom or the US um, for, for their, um, their university training and so have a big impact on how these uh, countries are perceived. Um, within, uh, for, uh, um, in terms of uh, we have perceived, and therefore, kind of the soft power is continuing to be strong. Also, um, I mentioned already before the movie industry, Hollywood, especially, and, and also in, 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 in to some extent, Bollywood from an Indian perspective, Indian perspective, are really important uh, um, ways to transfer cultural, let's say, cultural understanding or a kind of the way uh, people think within one, one country is transferred over movies very well. So Hollywood has a considerable influence in terms of soft power as well. I mentioned already in the, in the slide before the idea of research and development. And that is kind of going back to the kind of the power of the universities. The universities and their research departments in the United States are very good and therefore kind of lead the way as well in, 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 in technological terms as well. They are not alone. There are many other places, including uh, Japan, European countries uh, as well. Um, in Asia, the, the Chinese university is becoming stronger and stronger as well, especially in, in technology issues. Singapore, uh, Australia, many places in the world do have these kind of institutions which are, are kind of um, uh, strong in, 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 in the research part. And many of the top places are really in the United States, so that is kind of a key advantage for the United States. If you look at, um, at patent, we can also see, and this is an interesting aspect, I think, um, because uh, there are patents uh, uh, showing showing patent granted in the um, around per one million of population. So the idea is that the patents become bigger the more people are in the population. So that's why China is not actually um, very uh, very high in this list. 
um, we do we do see if we kind of calculate it based on the amount of population. Uh, Japan is, is, is the top with its uh, with, um, um, applications of patents. Have Korea and other high tech, tech um, um, societies very high. The United States come right after this. There's a big big gap between those uh, those countries, but they come right afterwards. And then Germany, Sweden, uh, Germany, France, etc. All kind of European countries, which are also kind of strong in the um in in, in uh, especially technology research so we do say that the united states is definitely competitive uh, competitive in this term um but and stronger than china um, but things like this can change quickly um and we see with huawei and other con technology companies that they are trying to reach the global market and try to be kind of technology leaders rather than than only kind of recipients and, and building uh um technology uh, gadgets and and things but rather kind of lead technologies there as well um we can look if you look at the uh the global reach um of uh, of the united states in the 21st century we can actually also say that in a way like financial military power if you kind of summarize this the us is probably still ahead of of china and in a way, a lot of the, the, the key topics are uh, discussed that like if your global trade is really kind of reliant on the position of um, um, of, uh, of the United States, global financial archi architecture is also kind of always um, with respect to what the position of the United States is. However, if we kind of look at climate change, it's also really, of course, the United States is really influential in this topic. but. Uh, in a way, it's kind of maybe weakening itself. The recent um, move or, or decision by Donald Trump to to um, get out of the of the Paris Agreement actually shows. Um, at the one hand, it shows that the United States is not on the forefront and the, uh, on kind of finding multilateral agreements on climate change, but the the fact that it kind of continues to exist without the participation of the United States shows that maybe in, in some areas, actually, the United States is becoming less influential than it used to be. So we can ask this question, will this kind of dominance be there in the future, or do we actually kind of see some kind of movement um, uh, towards other, um, other actors becoming more important? Um, I will kind of go back uh, to this idea about uh, Neil Ferguson in, in a minute and looking at this uh, from a historic perspective. And what we do see here is, for example, the, the kind of capital, um, uh, the capital investment um, which we had in the, um, which we had over time. So this is a part, uh, I think like basically, a bit more than a century ago, capital investment predominantly came from Britain and and some from other parts of of Europe. But all the capital in the in which was invested in the world, by and large, it came from the global uh, hegemonic power at of the time, namely uh, the the British Empire. There was some extent, of course, there was like here you see Japanese investment in. Uh, in China, it's also in the United States and then in, in Latin America. Um, also, some uh, to some extent, uh, uh, French and German investment within uh, within Europe and in, in, um, uh, French, Latin America, Africa, and some parts of Asia as well. But and already then some investment from the United States out as well. But the dominant part was really um, from the um, uh, from Europe. Um, then, if we look at 1967, the picture actually changed considerably. We don't have um, uh, we don't have this kind of dominance of um, of Europe and the UK as well. We do find still some investment here uh, from uh, uh, from uh, from uh, in Australia, also in the United States. Canada, etc., um, but not in the same way as uh, as we had um, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. And the United States really became the key actor. So we do see that from the United States 
it towards Europe, towards uh, Latin America, Canada, and other uh, Asia, is really coming at that point from the United States. So let's see, like, what is a newer ver version looking like? And this is 2012. So changes, of course, especially the position of China might have been become much more important. But what we do see is a much less uh, clear picture. So there's lots of investment from let, here from Japan in the United States, in Canada, or in Latin America. There's lots of investment from the U.S. still into Asia, into Europe. There's uh, investment from Europe into the United States, also Latin America, and India is also kind of really starting. Um, so we do have a, a much more, a very kind of diverse um, perspective where investment is not necessarily going in one direction, but rather in the, the several directions. So Europeans investing in the US, US uh, um, investing in Europe, uh, Chinese investing in Europe, um, Americans investing in China. So we have much more interaction going on. Um, the question is how this will develop in the future. Will we have the same situation after, after the pandemic or will we have kind of different trails in this? Uh, so this actually looks much more like a globalized world, but it can of course be, be reversed. Um, let me have a look here at the current leadership. And I think it is really important to look at the United States States, not only as, a, as an international actor, but also a, 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 with the current, um, what the current um, in, um, government is doing. And so what we do see is this kind of the, the start of, the, um, of um, President Trump's um, uh, um, campaign was really with the slogan, I want to make America great again. So he's kind of putting, the idea here is that there's some sense of uh, decline of the position of the United States and Trump wants, uh, President Trump uh, started with this claim uh, to, uh, to change this and kind of make it kind of revise, uh, revise um, the American position. Um, so I think that's an interesting fact because it shows that there is some kind of awareness in the in his government that the United States might not be in the most powerful position. The other thing is that the way he is kind of going about this in the in the uh, in his current um, uh, in his current term is really by moving the United States out of the international realm. At the one hand, there is no um, the military presence in the Middle East has been uh, has been reduced drastically. At the other hand, um, lots of international agreement, including especially uh, the Paris uh, Treaty, have been cancelled or kind of revised and and generally became less important or less got less, less attention by the United States. Also, less involvement in the international organizations, frequent criticism of organ international organizations not serving the United States. And we can see this even in the recent development about the World Health Organization during the, um, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, where the United States now um, claims that uh, um, the organization was predominantly kind of uh, um, following the Chinese perspective on um, on the, the the pandemic development, it was not serving well the United States, and he kind of refused to fund the organization in the future. So this shows again that we do have um, that we do have a move out of international organizations. We do have also increased protectionism. Um, the markets try to be protected, um, uh, lower stance on immigration, so less people getting into the country, and the, um, the calling of, of um, uh, trade treaties. So we have an inwards looking United States, much more than an outward looking United States. And a lot of people see that this might be a kind of a, a response towards the increased uh, power um, reduction of the United States, 
other people claim actually that this is integral in this kind of change. So it's not necessarily something which was inevitable, but rather that this kind of policies lead to an increased uh, power reduction of the United States. Um, I want to take you now again, take a little pause and look at the first link, what I have here, the election campaign of President Trump was to make America great again. This is a link um, to a video uh, kind of recorded um, with Norman Chomsky, one of the leading um, American intellectuals, so to say, uh, quite left-leaning, uh, but uh, really important intellectual. I want to listen to this, um, to this, uh, to this video carefully, and then look, uh, um, write down quickly whether you agree with the position of Norman Chomsky in hindsight. So, of course, this video has been done two years ago. So we know now more than he knew at the time. So what do you think about his video? Is he right with his assessment of the current administration, the political, uh, uh, the political system? So take a minute, watch the video, um, write it down, what you think about it, and come back. Of course, I would be happy if you upload your thoughts on our Padlet site as well. Okay. Well, now welcome back. Um, let me kind of give you a couple of thoughts at the very end of this um, of, uh, of this lecture to kind of round it up into the kind of the recent, maybe more recent political events. So the first one I want to highlight here is this kind of U.S.-China trade war, and the uh, expected economic consequences of it. So what we do see is that the, the U.S. has, with, the, uh, with um, uh, Donald Trump being the president, um, has changed its strategies on how to deal with China. Not necessarily the assessment that China might be a threat to the, to the U.S. economy changed, but rather the way it, uh, it deals with this threat. Under Obama, uh, the uh, Obama uh, presidency and even under the, the Republican uh, presidency of, uh, of uh, George W. Bush, we had some kind of containment with engagement policy. What does that mean, containment with engagement? Well, the United States tried to, at one hand, engage with, uh, with China using it like in, in a free market uh, way, um, uh, trying to kind of uh, trade with it as much as possible. But at the other hand, it tried a policy of containment. And um, uh, the, the key kind of parts were to kind of create trade agreements with a other Asian countries and the United States, which exclude China. And the idea here was very much that this could kind of um, kind of at the one hand reduce the worries some countries within Asia have over rising China and also be advantageous for the United States. Um, so uh, especially negotiations in terms of um, ASEAN and TPP um, uh, were, were around this, uh, this development trying to get trade agreements which are favorable for the United States and its Asian members and excluding China. Uh, under President Trump, uh, this uh, this uh, changed drastically, and the United States did not kind of engage in these trade agreements with other Asian partners anymore, but rather went head on with China and trying to kind of change the way the United States was trading uh, with China. This ended up in in a conflictual behavior where tariffs were put on Chinese goods, and, and as a retaliation. Um, Tariffs of American goods were put on, uh, um, or U.S. goods were put um, put on from China, and or, um, we, we commonly kind of call this a, a trade war between the two these two kind of countries. And now the question is, how does what does this mean uh, uh, for the for this um, for both of these actors and also the rest of the world? One thing about the rest of the world, it seems that it's not advantageous, neither for Europe or for Japan or any other countries that this trade war is happening. It's actually, it seems quite clear that all the other sectors are suffering as well. The other thing is that it, it seems that this trade war is not, um, 
has an impact on the uh, on the U.S. economy and the Chinese economy as well, uh, and it's kind of reduced uh, the economic strength of both countries in a time where especially uh, the United States tried uh, was actually having a good uh, um, uh, part in the economic cycle. Um, but um, this could, of course, um, the question now is really like, what will happen after the current pandemic? Will we have a different situation where um, where we, we expect that China will have much more economic problems uh, in terms of exports of its good, but also domestically um, done by the virus, and especially the United States and with a record um, um, job losses in, in, in just two months, which they didn't have seen since the, since the, uh, since the Second World War, and massive uh, uh, economic consequences an eco a financial crisis, which was just kind of um, uh, kind of uh, contained by the by the by the Fed. The, the, um, so we do have lots of um, a very difficult situation economically in both countries, and so it's really interesting to see what this what kind of impact this will have on the conflictual behavior in terms of trade. Um, so I. I, I mentioned already beforehand that, of course, the, uh, the current pandemic uh, is, uh, should be taken into consideration what will happen in the future as well. Um, some people argue that this could be catalyst to actually have a quicker change in the, in the global power structure. Other people would say like, no, actually, maybe this brings a, a different path for the United States as well, because it kind of will not be so conflictual anymore in terms of its uh, um, of its trade war, and maybe China will not be as expansionist anymore. Um, the, the, the vote is out on this. We don't, it's too early to actually say this, but it would be very curious um, to understand what, um, what impact this, uh, this um, current pandemic has on, on global development. So just to sum up uh, this topic, um, what do you think now? about the U.S. Uh, reach, uh, global reach in the 21st century. Do you think we had to hurt a multipolar world? Do you think maybe China can extend uh, its, its will um, across, the, uh, across the globe? Or do you think the United States will continue to be in the top position, uh, although maybe a little bit less strong than it used to be at the end of the 20th century, but still be the leader of the world? I want to kind of close this uh, lecture with a quote by Joseph Nye, which I think is really interesting, is that the problem of American power in the 21st century then is not one of decline, but what to do in, in light of the realization that even the largest country cannot achieve outcomes it wants without the help of others.